Hi. I can't tell you how much I wish I could be there to see you all face to face. My name is Eric and I have been using Python since 2006. I started getting involved with Python core development in 2010 and became a committer in 2012. My contributions have focused on the language and on the low-level CPython runtime, especially the import system. Currently, I spend what spare time I have improving Python's core, multi-core story. At my day job with Microsoft, I'm lucky enough to work full-time with Guido Van Rossum and others, making CPython faster. More on that later. We're going to start talking, let's start off talking about how we all love Python. Then we'll look at why Python is the way it is. We'll review some of my experiences as a Python core developer. And finally, we'll talk about how you have opportunities to be more involved. There will be some technical information in this talk, but not a lot. And at the end, I'll provide a link to resources that will help either way. Most of all, I want to help you see Python for what it is. First, there's the big reason we're having this conversation at all. Python has a special place in our lives and in our hearts. Really, so, so many people feel this way. But is loving something enough to make it important? That's something to think about. I think it is. But let's look a bit more closely to see if we can make sense of what we feel. So what is Python? First, Python was a British comedy troupe. We love it for the laughs. You can find recordings and movies on the internet if you want to watch. Why are we talking about Monty Python though, right now? It's because Python is named after Monty Python. Python's history, mailing list archives, code, and tools are all littered with references to Monty Python. Watch for them. And now for something completely different. So first Python was a comedy group. And then Python was Guido's pet project and his passion. We love it because Guido was, has given so much for so long and put so much of his, himself into Python. It started as a weekend project inspired by ABC, a programming language Guido worked on at CWI and has grown into a world changer. But it has stayed Guido's language which he is kind enough to let us use. After that, Python was a programming language. We love it because reading and writing Python code is a joy and makes us more productive. The Zen of Python shown here captures so much of the spirit of the language. And there are even more characteristics that make people fall in love with Python. It's easy to learn, yet powerful. It fits in your brain. It treats you like a consenting adult. It's the ultimate glue language. It's reader friendly. It makes you more productive and rarely gets in your way. The first public release of Python was in February of 1991, over 30 years. When Guido published the source code for 0.9.1 on a Usenet message board. Not long after Python was a programming language, it became an ecosystem. A lot of Python's early success comes from its import system. First of all, it was easy to share Python modules as text, as is. On top of that, extension modules let users write fast code in C, as well as rely on all the non-Python C libraries out there. And more success came from how easy it was to get small tasks done quickly especially at the command line. All that only got better as tools and services made it easier to share packages. Over time, Python has grown into many areas that have a big impact on the world. Python is many things and 
We love it for many reasons, but there's one more big thing we love about Python. It has always been a community. Python is people. It would not be what we love without all the people involved. It was founded in Guido's sensibilities and those of the early Python Labs team. The PSF was organized to protect Python and expand its impact and help its community. Early PyCons brought people together in person and people started organizing regional Python conferences all over the world. In 2012, attendance at PyCon US exploded and hasn't looked back. Python has become important across the globe. It has become the top language in many programming language indexes. To this day, it's pretty much the only major language that is community run and not dominated by the needs of the companies that created it or use it. Python is so much more than a programming language or a tool or a technology. It's the sum of the people who made it and the people who use it. That's the community to which we all belong, you and I together. Being involved with the Python language has taught me many technical things, but being involved with the Python community has made me a better person. I'm forever grateful. Fundamentally, Python is a diverse community with room for everyone to offer what they have. In our community, we don't get everything right all the time and have plenty of room to be better, but that's part of being human. The most amazing thing is how the community is full of people who care enough to watch over Python and its people, all in their spare time. From here on out, we're going to dig into the way our community is all about giving. I'll talk about it from my perspective and I'm most familiar with the small part of the community that has a big impact, Python core developers. A Python core developer is someone who has commit rights to the Python repo. As a result, the group of Python core devs is effectively who's responsible for taking care of Python, the Python language and code. That's it. Other than that, they're basically the same as anyone here. They collaborate on GitHub, on a public issue tracker and on public mailing lists and meet up in person a couple of times a year if possible. The one thing that sets them apart is something you can get just by being a decent person who loves Python and who helps out. That thing is trust. So at first Guido worked alone. Not long after publishing the Python source code in 1991, other people started sending him packages, patches. Eventually, that was happening often enough that he started letting some of those people commit their own changes. How did he decide? It boiled down to whether or not they could be trusted to not mess Python up. That's still the most important factor. Python core developers aren't superhuman. They have a mix of backgrounds, experience, skill level, areas of expertise, personal challenges, strengths, and weaknesses, just like everyone on this planet. What they all have in common is two things, a desire to take good care of Python and a high level of trust with other core developers earned by collaborating. And you can work to build that trust if you want to. I hope you do. For the most part, core developers work on Python in their spare time for free. Historically, only a few have been paid to work on Python and mostly part-time at that. I'm one of the lucky few. There is nobody telling core devs what to work on, nor is there any roadmap guiding them. However, there are many demanding voices on the internet. Each core dev decides what to do based on what they enjoy, what they already know, and what interests them. And 
what they think the community needs. In practice, they collaborate a lot, even if the back and forth is sometimes slow. When core devs have conflicting points of view, usually something big, there needs to be someone to make a final decision. Until a few years ago, that was Guido. Now it's the Steering Council, a group of five people elected each year by the active core developers. Why did Guido step down from that role? Sadly, maintainers of open source projects constantly get lots of unfair criticism on the internet, as well as unfair demands on their time and effort. This often eventually causes burnout. And this happens to Python core developers too. Python is over 30 years old now, so there have been many core developers. Many no longer participate, mostly for a lack of time or interest or due to burnout. There, really, there are only a couple dozen particularly active core developers. So it's amazing how Python keeps moving forward. Thankfully, most contributions actually come from regular folks in the community. However, we still need more core devs. We also need a more diverse group. Diversity is important for the success of any team, and the core devs recognize that. Until the last few years, the group has been a bunch of men, and mostly North American and European white men, like me. That's slowly changing, but it's still not nearly diverse enough. We want it to be better, and the team has been working to fix it, with Guido leaving, leading the charge, as always. So that's a look at core developers. You don't have to be a core dev to help Python, though. You don't even have to make changes to code to help. The community has a variety of needs. We'll talk about that at the end. If you do want to help with code, there is no real minimum requirement to contribute. Just basic tools, a love for Python, some free time, and, well, being a good human. You can have a real impact on the world by contributing to, to the Python community, whether as a core dev or not. I've been a core developer since 2012. It's been a very rewarding and sometimes frustrating and I've always been glad to offer what I can. Let's look at how that happened and what it's been like. It all started when I took a job where the project was written in Python. At that time, the language was a revelation to me. My prior programming experience was with Java, C++, and Macromedia Lingo. In 2008, I was introduced to the Python community it left me with a good impression. At that same time, I started learning on my own about how Python works. It helps that Python's implementation is so easy to explore. When I found out about the various official Python mailing lists, I started reading them. But I didn't start posting anything. I didn't know how to get involved, and I was a little scared about it too. I don't care who you are. Being an outsider is scary, but things started to change for me, for me when I attended PyCon in 2011. To put my overall journey in context, it was about four years from the time I started using Python until I became interested in core development. Then it was about another year before I actually got involved. Then it was another year and a half of involvement before I became a core developer. The interesting part is what happened between PyCon 2011 and becoming a committer. As I was saying, things really accelerated for me at that PyCon. I attended the sprints at the end of the conference, and it was amazing. Sprints are where contributors on a project all get together in a room and work on that project in person for one or more days. I sprinted on CPython that year. The PyCon sprints were four days long, and each day I sat with a bunch of core devs, especially Nick Coughlin, working on CPython. Every night, many of us would have dinner and hang out. 
It was great. I was energized. I felt connected. At that point, I started actually getting involved. Over the next year, I participated in a lot of email discussions, including about the namespace package PEPS. This helped my confidence and kept my enthusiasm up. During this time, I found an area on which I wanted to focus, the import system. Having a specialty area helped me be more involved and to focus my attention. It was critical to my progress. However, I still felt like I wasn't good enough when it came to code and only contributed a single patch all year. That changed at PyCon in 2012. This time, one of the core devs invited me to come to the Language Summit. That's where all the core devs meet in person for a whole day right before PyCon to talk about the language and make big decisions. I was heavily involved in discussions from that point on until the end of the sprints eight days later. I spent a lot of time with core devs who encouraged me to contribute. I also gave two talks during the conference. My excitement was overflowing, as Brett Cannon could tell you, and I forgot all about how I wasn't good enough. I ended up writing a bunch of code related to import lib, and several of my patches got merged. By late April, I would written my first language proposal, and I also implemented it, and that got merged in May. Remember, I wasn't a core dev yet. And honestly, I'm not sure I'd even thought about getting commit rights. Instead, my mind was on the work I was doing. I was so excited. Later, in September, I was asked if I'd like to be a committer. I said yes. So what happened after that? I kept going. I've learned so much, and I've been involved in lots of exciting work. Not everything has worked out the way I want, yet. I had a number of ideas I wanted to pursue and goals to achieve. My ambition was really high, but progress has been slow, and some of the things have become real reality while others are still not realized. But for one project, I put in a year or two of effort, and then that work became irrelevant. That's been one of the hardest parts, but I don't feel like my effort was ever wasted, and I don't regret it. I've learned firsthand that core devs are regular humans. They aren't immune to the failings of humanity. I've had my heart broken and motivation drained on several occasions. In fact, I almost gave up on contributing right after PyCon 2011, before I had even gotten started due to a harsh response on a mailing list. Later, two other times, unkind responses were so discouraging that I couldn't find the energy to contribute for months. That said, those are rare experiences in over a decade of my involvement with core development. Instead, normally, you can sense the genuine intent from the core devs to do the right thing. They really want people to feel welcome, whether a newcomer or not. Unfortunately, it can be hard to see that. So too many people get scared off and don't get more involved. The very few bad experiences I've had are more than compensated by all the good interactions I've had. In fact, I've made some of my best friends among the core devs. They're good people. Hmm. This looks a lot like life in general, don't you think? Well, let's look at some concrete examples. Specifically, we'll look at some of the work I've done. It'll help us see how core developers move Python forward. First, my first pep. At the time, I was helping make import lib the implementation of Dunder import to replace the C implementation. Part of that was figuring out in which module to put the tag part of cached PYC file suffixes. We couldn't put it in import lib because the tag is implementation specific. That's when I proposed adding sys.implementation. It wasn't a big proposal, 
and it made sense. So it all went fast and without controversy. My favorite part was adding types.simplenamespace, which I hope to make a built-in type at some point. On to my second pep, which I'm still really proud of. This time it was a proposal with more substance and significance. Python lets you customize the import machinery with importers, which were introduced in PEP 302. The API for importers required them to do things the import system really should be doing. On top of that, the import system threw away some useful information, especially coming from finders. So I proposed adding a new object to capture all the info needed to import a module. And we would adjust the import, importer API to make use of that object, which I called module spec. This would allow the import system to do all that extra work instead of the importers. The change made sense, so I didn't get much resistance. However, it wasn't a simple change and it required a lot of thought and discussion. Next, is a project that had a big impact on me. At the time, there were two pieces of information that I wanted Python to stop throwing away. First was the order of keyword arguments in a call that are captured by star star kw args. Second, the order in which names are defined in a class definition namespace. You know, when you say class, name, colon, and you have the body, the stuff in the body. Fixing these wouldn't change anything. Instead, it, we'd just be exposing existing information. So it wasn't all that controversial. The challenge was that both would require using order dict instead of dict. To do that, order dict would have to be rewritten in C. At that time, I had very very little experience with C, but I didn't expect anyone to do the work for me, so I took matters into my own hands. Working in my spare time, it took me a couple years to get it done, but in the process, I learned a ton, and order dict got 4 to 40 times faster depending on the operation. But it was hard to get a review on a patch of several thousand lines of code, which was part of why it took a while. I finally merged the patch and was getting ready to finish those two peps, which were the whole reason why I had worked on C order dict. Well, we were at the first ever core sprint. That's when Inada-san came forward with his implementation for compact dict. It preserved key insertion order, which is exactly what I had originally needed. But that meant that all of my work on C order dict became unnecessary. At first, I was massively disappointed. Uh, but, you know, I kept it to myself. I mean, how could I complain? Compact dict was a good thing. And I got what I had originally wanted. My two peps were accepted. I tried to be glad, but it was hard. However, it doesn't really seem like such a big deal to me anymore. And I'm glad that I learned so much in the process. It enabled me to make many contributions since then that I couldn't have otherwise. So even if things don't work out the way you want, don't let it get you down. On to my current personal project. It's been my personal project for over seven years. The infamous Gil has been a part of CPython from the beginning. It actually has lots of benefits and makes the runtime simpler, but it means multi-threaded CPU-bound Python code can't make good use of multiple cores. Honestly though, this doesn't affect that many people. However, so many people like to bring up the gill. 
and how their lives would be so much better if it weren't there. Really? Their lives wouldn't be that much better. But even though the guilt isn't really a problem, the conversation just won't stop. Not until Python has an obvious, unmistakable, and undeniable multi-core story. In 2014, I decided I was going to make that happen. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. For many months, I studied the problem on my own, looking for options, measuring them until I found a viable solution. Use the subinterpreter machinery that was already there, and then make interpreters stop sharing the gill. After that, you could use multiple interpreters if you want multi core processing. The other possible solutions had big unknowns and too much risk of failing. But with multiple interpreters, there weren't any big technical hurdles. The whole thing was well understood with little risk, just a lot of small tasks. Plus, 95% of those tasks were worth doing anyway for the health of CPython. So even if things didn't work out, it pretty much wouldn't have been a waste of time. But the solution would require three things. First, expose the existing interpreter APIs to Python code. Then add a way to communicate between interpreters safely and efficiently. And finally, properly isolate interpreters by getting rid of all the static global C variables. That last one is where things have dragged out. There were a couple thousand static globals to move into per interpreter state. I started working on it and have worked on it little by little, but sadly, I don't always have a lot of spare time. Thankfully, others started to help out and at this point, there are only a few hundred left. As to exposing the existing interpreter machinery to Python code, my PEP554 proposes adding a new module with a very minimal API. I'm particularly excited how it encourages what I consider a more human-oriented concurrency model. Here's an example. First, we create a channel for passing messages. Then we create a subinterpreter and run a script there in its own thread. Finally, we pass messages. There's more you can do, of course, with subinterpreters in PEP554, but that's the gist. There are also more capabilities that we will for sure add later. With the proposal, I just wanted to start off with the minimal capability. For the most part, everyone I talked to was super excited about subinterpreters. It took a little while to convince Guido, though. And there were also a few other people who objected, saying multiprocessing was enough. And let's not add yet another way. The one objection that worried me was about the impact on extension modules, most notably it was the NumPy maintainers that brought it up. To work with subinterpreters, an extension must get rid of its static variables, just like CPython is doing. And for some extensions, like NumPy, that can be a lot of work, just like it has been for CPython. But, I mean, we're not requiring support for subinterpreters, and non-compliant extensions won't break They'll still work just like now with a single interpreter. And otherwise, if you try and import them, the import will just raise an import error. And each extension can opt in when it's ready. So shouldn't be that bad, right? The problem is their users will demand subinterpreter support right away. So it's almost the same as if the core devs required the extensions to add support. Well, I don't want to make anyone's life harder to get just what I want, even if it's only a few big extensions. So we're working on a way, good way forward for that. While I have done a lot of work 
on my own for this, lots of other people have helped, both in discussions and with code. At a certain point, I realized I needed to make it easier for people to help, so I created a project on GitHub, put my notes there, started tracking tasks, and uh, made it a, a good tool for collaborating on the project. I pointed people there every chance I got, and it didn't take long before people in the community showed up to help. That's just how this community is. At this point, I'm still super hopeful about the project. There's been a lot of discussion lately about removing the guilt, but I don't think it will impact the work on interpreter isolation. Regardless, I hope to get everything done for Python 3.11 next year. Here's another example from my experience. It's my exciting work project with Guido and others. This is an interesting example because it involves people getting paid to work on Python where historically most work has been done by volunteers. The interesting part is the boundary between the two sides. Guido joined Microsoft in late 2020 and decided to work on improving CPython's performance. This last March, I had the opportunity to join him, working on it full time. And since then, we've added a few more people to the team. Most notably, Mark Shannon joined the team not long after I did. He's an expert in optimizing CPython, among other things. A big part of our performance improvements are coming from the strategy he proposed called adaptive specialization, which has roots in a lot of research out there. Early on, Guido had the insight to help us have us stay open and engaged with regular core work rather than hidden in isolation. That meant doing our work exclusively in the regular CPython repo and using the normal tools and core workflow. We coordinate our effort in a separate GitHub project, but it's public and plenty of people in the community are involved there. In effect, it's like a hub for related discussion and collaboration, much like other special interest groups that core development has. One thing I've noticed in this project is it can be hard for volunteers to keep up since our team can work on this full time. We try to stay, um, we, 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 we try to keep the needs of regular contributors in focus and we're not always going to be paid to work on Python either. So that matters to us, but it's a challenge. One thing that will get trickier is, is this, it'll get trickier as more companies contribute to CPython. Well, last but not least, I've been a mentor to aspiring Python contributors. I've had this rewarding experience on several occasions, and most of these have come as I've collaborated with people on multi-core Python. I'm going to focus on two occasions in particular. The first was in 2015 when I was working on C order dict. I told Guido about how I couldn't get a reviewer for my patch. He suggested that I find an aspiring contributor and walk through the patch with them. So I posted a message to the core mentorship mailing list and got lots of interest and ended up working with someone named Rose. We met several times online and I worked through my awkwardness and all of that. This is all new to me. And in the end, life got too busy for Rose. But in the meantime, she was super helpful. And I learned a bit about mentoring. Meanwhile, at PyCon 2015, Guido gave a great keynote talking about diversity. In fact, Guido has always been a strong advocate for diversity. At the podium that year, he offered to mentor women that want to become core developers. Several took him up on his offer, and he continues to be a mentor. At the Language Summit in 2016, Guido challenged us to be more proactive about diversity. Both this and his 2015 keynote had a big impact on me. 
It doesn't come easy for me, but I wanted to make a difference, so I made an effort. It just took a while. At PyCon 2018, I had a great chat with Emily Morehouse. She was interested in helping with my multi-core Python project. Guido had been mentoring her, and I took over at that point. We met relatively frequently for the rest of the year, and Emily was really helpful. But what I really appreciate is her willingness to talk about all the challenges. There were several occasions where we had long conversations about like being a woman in tech or about being an outsider in general and what it takes to break through those barriers. I, I really cherish those conversations. And any insight I might have into breaking those barriers is thanks to Emily. Incidentally, she became a core developer at the Core Sprint later that year. One important thing I've noticed about mentoring was it took a lot of my already spare time away from coding and slowed down a lot of the progress on my project. But it's totally worth it. I'd be glad to do it again and let me know if you're interested. Okay, so after all those examples of my court of experience, you might have started to worry. Don't. Those were big examples, and nearly all contributions are actually little things. A lot of those are done by people who aren't core, dev get core devs, for example. Take a look at these. Things like this are within reach of all of you, so don't be afraid. And don't forget, there are lots of ways to be involved and contribute to Python. Something as small as telling someone on the issue tracker what you need Python to do for you is a big help. Or sending a contributor an email just to say thank you. Yeah, there are lots of ways to help out. Just be patient. Remember, the core team is really nice and helpful, even if they're not perfect. They want to encourage contribution, but it's a real challenge. It can be hard for people on the outside to feel comfortable with getting involved. It's something the core devs think about. What does it take to break through barriers to contribution, whether technical barriers or not? That brings us back to the idea of community. The meaning of community is found in how its people connect. We must ask ourselves, how do we help others feel like they belong? How do we break down the barriers between us? This topic really means a lot to me. So perhaps we can approach this from a different angle. How can you contribute to Python's community? There's so much more out there than just writing code. You can organize meetups to bring other people together. You can teach. You can encourage, advocate, and mentor. You can join in discussions. You can be a good example. You can help with the infrastructure. You can help with next year's PyCon Thailand or PyCon APAC. Remember that Python is volunteer driven and would benefit from whatever you're good at. Most of all, we need to do everything we can to help people on the outside of our community come in and join us. We're all outsiders in one way or another. In my own experiences as a mentor, I've realized the most powerful impact is in the figured act figurative act of reaching out and pulling someone into the group. In that spirit, I challenge you to look around you and welcome others in. Okay, let's draw this discussion to a close. We've covered a lot of ground. Where does Python stand? Python's place in the world is clearly affected by what it helps you get done and how quickly. And Python's place in the world is intimately tied to how the people in this community are connected. But most importantly, Python's place in the world will be determined by what you do about it. I appreciate your trust in inviting me here today and the trust that the Python community has in me as a Python core developer. And again, I'm so thankful for all the things Python has brought to my life. I'm hopeful we have some time for some questions. And here's some resources related to this talk, as well as where to find me online. Enjoy. I really love the way that you highlighted that 
trust and kindness were kind of the most important qualities towards contributing to Python in a way far above kind of programmer skill, like we would naively assume. This is obviously this is used everywhere, so it's very important that everything be done correctly. Um, but it's it's very encouraging to what many would consider inaccessible at first. So thank you for that. Yeah, I'll, I'll say that a lot of it is thanks to Guido. I mean, just the, uh, you know, he's a real smart guy, but there's a lot of Python and its community that are founded in just Guido's uh, kindness and and the care that he has for other people, the interest he has in helping other people all the time. It just really shows through. Awesome. So we have a couple of questions to start. What is your thought about the top demand or challenge in the core deck community at the moment? Well, it's, it's mostly along the lines of what I said in the talk, that uh, one of the hardest things is um, finding, building that trust with people, right? So um, for, for the core developers, I mean, it's uh, on the one hand, it's hard for us to know what Python needs to an extent. So we have to really work to, to figure it out rather than just scratch our own itches all the time. But then on top of that, um, we also need to make sure there's enough people to take care of Python. So, you know, we, we have a, a bunch of core developers, but not everybody has the time. And, and so, and in any community, including the core devs, uh, benefits from having just a, a diverse group. And you know, I, I think that's one thing that we're working on, but it's a hard problem to solve. Um, and definitely one that we'd welcome any help. Um, yeah, I mean, those are, it's mostly people things, right? Really the biggest, biggest challenges are probably always people things. Yeah, I, I like that you described a lot about the kind of setbacks that you could have even, I mean, this is common to any project when we work with people in, in your work professionally or elsewhere where you did a lot of work to get some feature developed and then for whatever reason it gets rejected. And so getting past that, has that made you like stronger, more resilient person in terms of your contributions? Absolutely. I, it, it really, those experiences, it, it, it kind of formed a point at which I had to ask myself what was important to me. You know, was the code important or, you know, was I going to hold on to that or did I need to look at really what mattered and what ended up mattering wasn't the code. I mean, in those experiences, what really mattered was, were the things I learned and the, the experience of, of working through that project. Yeah, so it sounds like the, the time you spend can often be a challenge. Um, so we had a question that was, how do you find a balance in your spare time when there's there's so much, everyone is limited in the day, the, the amount of time that they have. And if you wanna to contribute to open source, do you have to give up your other hobbies that you like to do? Right. Yeah, I guess it depends on the person. For me, uh, it's a challenge. Um, I know there are plenty of people that that it comes easy to them, so I don't know, but I expect that no matter who you are, there's some level of sacrifice. And I think if you look at people who have contributed, that um, they make that sacrifice because they really care about the Python community, the Python language, and, and they want to be good stewards, whether or not they're core developers, in fact. I mean, there are many people that sacrifice their time who don't have commit rights. It doesn't really make that big a difference because they care, and that's why they're doing it. Yeah. Um, to dive into a, just a bit of a technical discussion, do you have any idea what effect the recent global interpreter lock removal efforts might have on the sub-interpreter work? Uh, so 
I talked about this a little bit. I don't think it will have a big impact, but we'll see. So there's there are some things that and and first of all I'll say that you know there's no guarantee that either project will end up uh, becoming a reality, right? And that's definitely one thing I've learned uh, through all of my experience as a core developer is things don't always work out the way you want. But um, with sub interpreters, there are uh, there's some complexities. I, I talked about this a little. There's some complexities involving extension modules, where there's some issues with compatibility that require uh, maintainers of those modules to fix things. And then uh, I I like to think that it's it's not that big a burden, but I'm not doing their work, so you know I I'm not really in a good position to to say anything like that. With no gill, it's it's a little different story, but we'll see how it plays out. There, there are a number of things that have to go in. There's the challenge of not drastically um, making our normal uses of Python, which is single threaded, you know, single core Python. Uh, we don't want to make that slower, right? For the sake of people that want to do multi core stuff. So. Um, there's that constraint. We'll see how how close that can be, but it looks it looks the the current work looks like it's maybe uh, close enough. We'll see. But there's also some open questions on really what impact it's going to have on extension authors because um, with the no gill, um, it basically opens up extensions to the pain that's inherent to doing program whereas right now the guild right. protects, protects them so if the guild goes away then now they have to to deal with all that stuff and maybe it won't have a huge impact uh, it'll probably impact some extensions it's it's really hard to say so um, they both have challenges if they both go in then that means that authors of extension modules have to fix things for both things, right? So, you know, and then you say, well, if we have no gill, then why do we need um, sub interpreters, right? Because aren't they solving the same problem? I would argue that they're not. I mean, there's a lot of overlap. And if we have the sub interpreter work that I'm, I'm advocating, I, I would say that the no gill stuff becomes less important, but um, you know that's my perspective. Yeah, so there's a balancing act between the the work that you wanted to do to enable these speed ups with not passing a lot of burden onto the author of extension modules at the same time. Yeah, there's cool. uh, as a core developer, there's a lot of of uh, I don't know. I, I feel a lot of responsibility for the impact that I have on other people. And I, I don't want to make other people's life harder just to get what I want. Yeah, absolutely. That's an extremely responsible take. I'm sure everyone appreciates you for it. Um, if, if someone here today watching this talk wanted to start contributing to Python um, in the simplest possible way, is there something like a good first issue tracker with well spec tasks where they wouldn't have to have a lot of back and forth? Or is there some more specific advice other than get involved in the mailing list that they can identify something at their skill level that they can contribute meaningfully? Uh, if, if somebody wants to just like feel it out and everything, you know, that there are definitely communication mediums. I've always found that it's helpful to find somebody who you can talk to, right? whether or not they're a core developer, but somebody who who would be glad to talk about it and point them in the right direction. But you know, aside from that, uh, the issue tracker, there are some labels that you can search for that are uh, can help you find things to do. Um, and you know, that's that's always great. You read through the dev guide, which is. Uh, you can find that in the Python documentation. Um, 
that's a, a great place to start because it kind of points you at what to do. Um, there's all sorts of different ways that you can contribute. So it's not even necessarily code. But if you want to get involved, right. like on, on the, the core development side of things, then uh, I mean the, the issue tracker is good, but it, it's in a way it can almost be too impersonal. Um, right. And like any online communication medium. So I don't know. I would encourage anybody who, who really wants to get involved to find somebody to talk to and just start from there. Um, if you don't feel like you're at that point yet, then, uh, you know, just read the mailing lists and, and uh, kind of get familiar with things. But for me, the my experience changed drastically when I started to actually interact with people more directly and, uh, you know, gotten calls or met with them in person at PyCon and it changed everything. Um, but I, I think there's a, definitely this is something that people have thought about a lot more. Um, I haven't really been in a position to, to uh, help out with a lot of those discussions. I know that there's a lot of interest on the, in the group of core developers to make it easier. So to answer that question. Yeah, I think a lot of projects are, are struggling to make it easier to contribute and, and trying to find every way possible. So sounds like finding a mentor or someone you can talk to about what kind of stuff you'd like to do, finding out what problems they're facing, probably the, the easiest way because it really brings the human aspect back to the the development process and it doesn't have to be a huge commitment i mean it i expect there are plenty of people who would be really helpful to talk to who'd be willing to spend 10 or 15 minutes or or more you know but um it's it, i know it's hard to to bridge that gap for all of us to reach out to somebody and say hey could you spend some time talk to me you know i i, I know most of us really it's hard to to take that step, um, but I know that once you do, uh, it, it feels so much better. You you can you can see when you talk to people because guarantee you whoever you talk to they'll be happy to talk to you. You'll come away feeling like, yeah, that was not as bad as I thought, and I'm glad I did it. Great, yeah. Well, I think there's quite a few people in the audience who would enjoy chatting with you about that. So will you be available in the open space after this for them yep. to come to you with any questions? OK, so everyone, you can find the, the open spaces tab and have a little bit closer discussion with Eric there. So thank you so much for your talk today and having a chat with us.